Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. But before I commence um, today's talk, um, I would be failing in my duty if I do not um, show my gratitude uh, to the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Bowler, the Force Commander, and uh, of course the dignitaries. But most importantly, I think it's a very difficult task which you all have given me. After such a fabulous song which I've just heard, I hope uh, that before we go into what are the dynamics of war, I hope uh, the dignitaries present here today will uh, definitely promote this group to go for uh, Coke Studio or maybe uh, you know, Pepsi Metal of the Bell. University, the Salvation Strategic Civility Institute University. I'd be more than happy uh, to support um, a special uh, promotion uh, for the group uh, on behalf of Salsi University so that uh, you guys can make your promo. We will uh, give you uh, a cultural scholarship uh, so that will allow you to put forward what you've just exhibited here for the rest of the day. Now, I think uh, the hard task is to talk to you about war. I think uh, being in Gilgit Baltistan, perhaps we understand this better than anybody else. I would just like to know how many of you own a phone at the moment? Can you all raise your hands? How many of you use this to communicate with the rest of the world? We got to be more honest than that. If you're not going to be honest, there is going to be no communication. Um, the Vice Chancellor asked me to talk to you about non-kinetic warfare. I was hoping to talk to you about Kashmir because I thought this is something which is affecting all of us in this room and which will also affect the future. But before we go into it, I'm just going to leave two definitions of what non-kinetic warfare is. What does this all mean? What is all this jargon about fifth generation warfare? Does it really affect us, number one? Number two, are we the victims or are we actually the front line of defense? Now here, the question is, before we go into all of this, can the students tell me two things? If you can answer me these two things, I think we will be on a strong footing to put it to start this conversation. First of all, do you think the country at this moment is in a state of war? How many of you think we're in a state of war? And how many of you think we're in a state of peace? So those who believe that we're in a state of war, please raise your hands. How many of you believe that we're in a state of peace? Well, it's a good news to see that a lot of you believe that we're in a state of peace. How many of you believe that we're in a state of crisis? All right. So this basically means that we are actually in a state of war. But because crisis is nothing but something which is leading up to a situation where war is imminent or we can feel it next to our doors. So in this context, we need to understand what does war mean in today's time. Does it mean that your militaries would be fighting against other militaries? Does it mean your people would be fighting against other people? Or does it mean that it's your mind which will be confronting the minds of the other? Actually, today, war is the sum total of all of these. Now, when we talk about traditional war, traditional war was considered around a triangle. The triangle was the people, the armed forces, and the government. This is known as the Trinitian concept of Clausewitz and the Trinitian concept of war. So this concept stated that if the people, the armed forces, and the government believe that they have to pursue policy by the use of force, then perhaps the state was at war. So what happens in non-kinetic warfare? In non-kinetic warfare, or the fifth generation warfare, we actually have a very different thing. First thing, it's the people. All wars concern people. There is no doubt about that. Second thing is that it is no longer about just armed forces. It is about the attrition of resources. What is the first battle which comes to your mind? Are we getting the right amount of resources which we are due? 
So first thing your enemy does is that he ensures that the attrition of resources becomes a common concept. Second is the attrition of will. That you think that can I or can I actually make a difference? So your ability to believe that you can bring about change through peaceful means or through the instruments of power which are at your play or are within your reach seem to be impossible. So this, there's a sense of despondency which needs to be created in the society. And once that is created, you have an attrition of will. And third is, of course, maneuver. So where do they maneuver? Do they maneuver things, physical concepts? No. They maneuver minds. But how do they maneuver minds? By creating something real in the battlefield, that means something next to you, and after a few minutes, you're fighting over social media. And you will find that impacting on your culture, impacting on your way of thinking, but most importantly, onto the way in terms of how you respond. At this moment, everything is about big data. Everything is about artificial intelligence. So how does this artificial intelligence and big data work? If I am the enemy, I am not concerned who you are, but I am concerned what data point you're giving me. So what you're looking at is more and more non-governmental organizations coming into our areas, asking about basic data from us, and then using that data to manipulate the behavior pattern which we will see. And also to see how we respond to our culture, how do we respond to our religion, how do we respond to our gender, and then most importantly, how do we respond to our age? And what are the problems which we face? What is the biggest problem we as students face once we think about it? It is what will be our future? Will we be successful? Will we be able to achieve our goals or will there be something much more stronger? And what we find is that these big data pools, these artificial intelligence tools, actually create different impediments which come into our mind and which believe, which make her believe that if we live the structured life which we're looking at, we will not be in a position to achieve our goals. So the first maneuver is to believe that the social transformation which you're looking for will not be within your reach. The education which you're aiming for will not be completed. And from the education into the real world, what will happen will not be available to you. So this is the first form when we say that non-kinetic warfare or non-kinetic threat is at play. Now, what's the sec second component of this? The second component of this is implosion. There's a saying by Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, uh, the ambassador of us, have mentioned uh, a scholar um, a war strategist as Kotilia or Shankya from the Indian mythology or the Indian thinking. Uh, but from the Chinese, uh, there is somebody known as Sun Tzu, and he is somebody which is much more close up into this region than perhaps anywhere else. And what did he say? He says to win the battle without fighting a single, without fighting a single bullet is the acme of skill. So how do you win the war without fighting? How do you win the war without losing your people? That is what fifth generation warfare is. So how do they do it? They do it by creating a credibility crisis between state institutions and your social contract with the state institutions. So what is the state based on? State is based on three points a day. One are the law enforcement agencies, the armed forces and the paramilitary institutions, which provide that semblance that there is a certain law and there will be certain dispensation which will be given to you as a result of you being a citizen. Second component of that is what? Is your government. That you believe that your government will deliver for you. The funds which will come to your government will come to your people. If you believe that the funds which have come to your government are not being given to you and there is incessant corruption, what do you feel? You feel that you've been robbed of your natural resources and you feel that you're robbed of your destiny because that governmental structure is not following through. And third component is of course that transformation which is based on people, education and your cultural context. So if you think that those things you have to choose between them, it's not working through. So what does um, third generation warfare do? It breaks the credibility of the leadership. 
So the first person which is under attack is your leadership. It means your military leadership. It means your paramilitary leadership. It means your civil leadership. But most importantly, it's not that those people will be affected by whatever is said. But what's important is that it is your belief system about them which will be affected. So what we see is implosion. I'm sure you must have heard a concept known as um, Punjabi police or Punjab police. I'm sure. How many of you have, have you heard this concept? 